Good morning. Good morning. I knew somebody was out there. That's good. Uh, before we begin our time of worship this morning, welcome to Sycamore. Uh, delighted that you're here. Uh, we have friendship pads that should be on the, uh, in your pews. Uh, sign in, especially if you're visiting with us. If you're visiting, don't worry. We don't uh, hit you with robocalls or anything like that, but I uh, want to welcome you. If you're sitting next to somebody you may not know, this is an opportunity to, to uh, get to know them. New member class, uh, the 29th, 8.30 a.m. Contact uh, the church office to register for those if you're interested in becoming a member of our congregation. Vacation Bible School, it's going to be here before we know it. Volunteer signups continue, many are needed. So details and sign up forms are in the family room. Um, if you're new here and not quite sure where the family room is, ask somebody that looks like they've been here for a while and they can take you down to the family room. Uh, there is no congregational meeting following this worship service, so I won't make that announcement. Uh, the Men's Fellowship, Stonemasons, uh, Final Four Games on April 1st, details in the cafe. If you're not familiar with the cafe, it's, well, it's in front of me, but it's behind you uh, directly across the hall there, so join us for that. We have the opportunity to gather for worship, and this being the Lenten season, a uh, time of reflection about the meaning of our faith. Um, to help us focus upon that, we have the presentation of the Lenten symbols by uh, Heather Lewis this morning. A sponge and a bowl of vinegar. When Jesus asked for a drink, someone offered him bitter wine in a sponge. It still happens today when we offer a little charity to deal with a major problem. Very few people would reference Psalm 31 as being something that speaks uniquely to their life setting. When I read it the other day, I thought, what a shame that these words don't receive more visibility. I want to share them with you as we are called to worship. You are my rock and my fortress, for the honor of your name, lead me out of this peril. Pull me from the trap my enemies set for me, for I find protection in you alone. I entrust my spirit into your hand. Rescue me, Lord, for you are a faithful God. I hate those who worship worthless idols. I trust in the Lord. I am overcome with joy because of your unfailing love, for you have seen my troubles and you care about the anguish of my soul. You have not handed me over to my enemy, but have set me in a safe place. Friends, come with joy in our hearts and let us worship God.
knowing that we have a unique and remarkable capacity to miss the mark, may we approach God ever confident of God's mercy, meeting us just where we need to be freed from the burden and baggage of our sin. Friends, will you please pray with me? Gracious God, we are so often the total package, but not in the way that we would like to believe. We are often stubborn, willful, selfish, preoccupied, thoughtless, self-absorbed. And Lord, the kindness we could do eludes us. And sometimes we are masters of doing the things that hurt and sting. Have mercy on us, Lord. You know that we are burdened by the knowledge of what we've done, but also the reminders of the things we've left undone that could bear your mercy and grace into this world. As only you can, Lord, by your Spirit, bring your mercy and grace into our lives. Clear away the clutter and transform us into the people you would have us and desire us to be. Always to the glory of Christ Jesus, our living and loving Lord, in whose name we pray. And may we continue with just a moment of silent and personal confession. Amen and amen. Hear the good news. You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from a book that is challenging, often in a way that leaves us caught a bit off guard because the book of Ecclesiastes is often filled with words that would appear to be cynical, hopeless, lifting up the futility and the emptiness of life, places that we go to when we're not at our best. And yet at the conclusion of the book, there is this word of resolution that kind of puts a bow around it and reminds us of that which matters most. Taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, reading at verse 9. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. 
The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
<laughs> and now I have to preach. What wonderful godly chaos. What, what a celebration to have kids in our midst. Uh, what a great thing. Um, I'm delighted they were here. Uh, we've been uh, talking the past few Sundays, this being the season of Lent, of uh, certain gods, idols that vie for our allegiance in life. Certain things that we may not have given a lot of thought to that we may have taken for granted. Well, for example, we've talked about the food god and how that influences and shapes our lives. These, these gods and goddesses who um, uh, vie for the allegiance of our heart and the direction of our lives. Uh, food god, the sex god. This morning, talking about entertainment. Uh, we've used the term idols, worshiping false idols. Now, it's important to understand what the role of idols played within uh, the ancient world and in some cultures today. You see, you and I may see idols as just little figurines or statues, a representation of the god or goddess. For the people in Moses' day, for some cultures today, the idol contained the very presence of that god or goddess. Now think about what that means. That it, it means that that individual could carry the presence of that god or goddess with them no matter where they went. They could reach into their pocket and pull out their idol. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? See, when they left home and they reached in their pockets and discovered that their idol was not with them, they felt a little anxious, they felt unprotected, they felt alone. When you leave the home and discover you've forgotten this, how do you feel? A little anxious? Unconnected? It's interesting. I'll put my idol back in my pocket. The God of entertainment. The idol of entertainment. Exerts influence very subtly in our lives. Solomon's going to help us on this uh, journey to think about and reflect upon the role of entertainment in our lives. Solomon uses his life as a sermon. At times the word translated as teacher, it can also be translated as preacher. And and the book of Ecclesiastes is really a, a, a sermon. It's, he's, he's making his way to one single point at the end of his sermon. And the, the, the sermon opens with these inspiring words. Meaningless. Meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. How's that for inspiration and hope? You wake up Monday morning and that's your devotion text for the coming week. How do you feel? Why does he begin his book that way, his sermon? My guess is that he began his sermon that way because many would have looked in Solomon's life and envied it. Need to remember who Solomon was. He had anything and everything a person could want. He had wealth, success, he had prestige. Under his uh, leadership, uh, the kingdom of Israel expanded its borders and reached its zenith. Jesus even refers to, to Solomon and his clothes. And I imagine that there would be some people who looked at his life and, and, and thought, oh man, he's got it made. He's got everything. Clothes, power, success, wealth. He's a published author. He's got 700 wives, which I don't get, honestly. 
You know what that means? 700 mothers-in-law. The guys here can laugh if you want to. And so people would look at his life in the same way that, I don't know, you and I might look at the life of someone when the news says that one individual has won the Powerball, $250, $300 million. And we think to ourselves, oh, what a life. Solomon says not so fast. And he uses his own life as an example in his sermon. And he picks out various things, all the things that people would have cited in his life that they wanted. He's, he talks about labor, what we would call today a career. He concludes, it's, it may give meaning and purpose in this life, but in terms of feeding our souls and bringing everlasting meaning and purpose to our lives, it is a chasing after the wind. He, he, he then turns his attention at, at, at one point to wisdom. Ah, now wisdom. Of course, Solomon, the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, all wisdom literature. Of course it's wisdom. It must be wisdom. And he says that's a chasing after the wind. It's a heavy burden. Because as wise as humankind can become, it cannot understand completely the purposes of God and everlasting life and eternity. He gives himself to enjoying life, to pleasure. Well, maybe what you and I would call entertainment. And he says that too, in terms of finding everlasting purpose in life, is a chasing after the wind. It reminds me of how we might enjoy cotton candy that first fills our mouth with sweetness and then disappears completely and we're still hungry. There has to be more. There has to be something else. And as he makes his way through his sermon, he comes to the conclusion. The end of the matter. What feeds our souls? What can we do in this life that we can carry with us into the kingdom of God when we depart this life? He says, fear God and keep his commandments. Fear and respect God. Live his values. Live his commandments. That is the entire duty of humankind. That is what can give us true and everlasting sense of purpose. That is something that we can enjoy in this life and carry on into the life in the presence of God forever. How does that help us with entertainment? Now, some of you may be skeptical. You may, you may be thinking, entertainment, what's, what's the problem with entertainment? How can entertainment be a negative thing in my life? Well, entertainment can, can change us, can change how we think, can change the values that we accept, it can impact, for example, the, the worship service and how we worship. Entertainment wants to be the purpose of worship. And perhaps we've evaluated worship services when someone asks us, how was worship today? We might have said, it was good. I felt lifted. I felt uh, inspired. I felt so good about worship. And it, perhaps at other times you might get that same question and respond by saying, well, it just didn't seem to move me. It wasn't there. And it, it sounds so familiar to how we might talk about the latest movie we've seen. Did you like that movie? No, I had a trouble following the plot. It just didn't. It was kind of dark. I just, it didn't. I felt bad after I saw that movie. Or the opposite. Oh my gosh, you have got to see this movie. It wants to take over and become our worship. I visited a, a, a church sanctuary, and I noticed instead of pews or chairs, they had 
theater seating with cup holders. No ideas. Don't get any ideas. And that very subtly communicates that we're there for entertainment, not for worship. That's what entertainment wants. That's what it seeks. Entertainment can change us and our values and the way we think. I found myself at times watching movies and cheering for the bad guy, the person who wants revenge. <laughs> of course, that's what Jesus said, right? Don't get even. Uh, don't get mad. Get even. And we begin accepting things very subtly through entertainment that we may not have so easily accepted before seeing that movie or that, having that experience. Entertainment can change us very subtly how we think, what we should feel, what we should accept or not accept. Entertainment comes after our money. And in our culture and worldwide, we spend lots of money on entertainment. How much? Let me share some figures with you. In 2012, $25.4 billion was spent on professional sports in the U.S. You can't wait to the final four, can you? $25.4 billion. An additional $35 billion was spent on sports-related merchandise that same year. The average cable bill for a family in the U.S. in 2016 was $103 a month, or $1,236 a year. I didn't look up satellite TV, sorry. There's more. You like Kings Island. It's a great place. The company that owns Kings Island made $1.16 billion in 2014. It's a lot of money. In 2015, $91.5 billion was spent on video games worldwide, while $38 to $40 billion was spent on movies that year. Now, before you start thinking you want a piece of that action, <laughs> let's think about what that means. Entertainment is after our resources and also after our resources of time. It's the time spent playing those video games rather than being outside or interacting with individuals. The time spent. In fact, entertainment has invaded our cars, hasn't it? Some models you can make your car a Wi-Fi hotspot. What could possibly go wrong with that? You also have cars with entertainment systems so that on long trips we can turn on the movies and the kids in the back are absolutely quiet and no one is talking to anyone during the trip about what they're seeing, about being together. When we're sitting with somebody, we may be sitting with several individuals, we may be playing Candy Crush or solitaire on our phones rather than talking with each other and being with somebody. I had a good friend who was on his date night, on his date night with his wife. They're out to dinner. He was, got a text or something. He's looking at his phone. He's, he looks up and his wife is on her phone. They put their phones away, realize that on this date night where they're supposed to be communicating and having this time, they were self-absorbed into their own phones. Entertainment invades our relationships, our cars, our time, our money, our values. So then, is all entertainment wrong? It, is, does it mean that, that you and I as Christians should be like the Amish? and totally unplug? No. Remember, the season of Lent calls us to be reflective. 
It calls us to be people, not just during Lent, but people of faith who are mindful and reflective about what these things mean to us and how they may guide and direct our lives away from our Redeemer. So, what is the difference? Where do we find that line between watching a movie and going to a movie and enjoying that experience and having that experience lift up? You've almost certainly been to movies, I'm willing to guess, that, that you have come out and said, that was a great movie. I feel inspired. I feel encouraged. Is that wrong? No. Let me make some suggestions to think about, reflect upon. Maybe you know some individuals who have blanket prohibitions. You know, what comes to my mind are the, the evil five. Maybe you know someone who says, okay, to be a Christian means you can't go to movies, you can't play cards, you better not dance. You... Uh, the other two are in there someplace. <laughs> Can't play. No smoking. No drinking. The thought is that if, if you stay away from those five, you will live the righteous lifestyle, a lifestyle God approves. But you and I both know that someone can not go see movies but still be a racist. You know, somebody who may abstain from tobacco as a matter of being righteous and yet hate his neighbor or her neighbor. So, the only blanket prohibition about entertainment is that we should have no blanket prohibitions. Because the line in entertainment varies from person to person. It's very important for us to know our own limits. And we do that reflectively and mindfully and prayerfully. And I'm willing to guess that you probably already know your limits. For example, you know what movies, I've mentioned earlier, you know what movies lift you. You've come out of a movie saying that was great. And you've also gone to a movie, I, I would imagine, where you came out and said, why did I spend my money on that? You know your limits. Those limits are different for everyone. And so we need to mindfully and prayerfully think about that. Think about the role of entertainment in our lives. So let me also make some suggestion as we find what those limits are. Um, some things for you to consider. Can you imagine your life without cable for three or four days? I know, final four... Okay, after the final four, can you imagine your life without cable or satellite TV? I'm not saying cut the cable. I'm not saying throw out your TVs. But go a week without cable. If we feel a lot of anxiety around that, if that becomes difficult for us, for you and me, then that's something we need to look at and prayerfully consider. Maybe that's shaping my life in a direction it ought not to go. Can you take a trip in the minivan with the kids with the entertainment system off? I'm not saying rip out the entertainment system in your minivans or SUVs. But the next trip you take, try it. You will have some discussions, I guarantee it. There was one time when my kids were little that we endured a 16-hour trip in one day. We were on our way to Montana going through Wyoming, and Wyoming looked a lot smaller on the map than it actually was. No entertainment system. All five of us are still alive. Try it. Can you imagine a device-free dinner with your family. 
No iPads, no cell phones, not looking something up, not checking the scores. Does that cause some anxiety? Reflect on that. So the responsible Christian, the responsible thing to do is not to rip these things out of our cars, not to throw out our TVs, but to be reflective. How much money are we spending? How much time does entertainment absorb? And it, it, the question is not whether we can afford the cable bill. The question is what does cable mean to us, even if we can afford it? How does it shape our lives and go after the allegiance of our hearts? Entertainment can be a very good thing. It can refresh us. It can build fellowship. It can aim our lives in the right direction. Or it can very subtly move us in a direction away from God. As God's people, it's very important for us to reflect upon those things, to pray about those things. God wants to be involved in that reflection in your life. He delights with his grace and forgiveness to move us through that process, to sanctify us. Entertainment can be a good thing, but it can never feed our souls. It can never be an end in itself. It dissolves away into meaninglessness. Let us be people who reflect on that, who pray about that, who joyously seek to tackle that issue in our lives. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us above all? Thank you.
You know, the church at its very core is a volunteer organization. We are together dependent upon the efforts of so many to bless and enrich and propel our life forward. And when we think of those who volunteer, we think of officers, teachers, musicians, those who share in nursery, laborers, gardeners, knitters, bakers, greeters, coffee servers, ushers, valets, prayer partners, and so many more. I think of those who may be on their knees in prayer or on their knees like one trustee has been over recent weeks, Bob Fieldman, in redoing the restrooms across from the kitchen. That's a shout out for Bob. Where would the church be without the many who volunteer? And so our family ministry has invited us to kind of reflect on that. That's a rich topic and we're going to think about it now reflectively in a very special way. To our volunteers, we thank you. You get up early, you're the last ones out the door, day or night. You serve to be a part of the bigger story that is unfolding. You play the role that only you can play. And it's a story that we're all writing together. You realize that serving is more than the task that you do. It's more than making coffee. It's more than cleaning, or playing an instrument, or working behind the scenes, or hosting a small group, more than hanging out with teens, or playing trains with a child, more than handshakes and warm smiles, more than singing a song or having a conversation. It's way more than that. You serve to build a church community that welcomes people wherever they are at. You serve to create a safe place to explore faith. You serve because God first served us. You serve as a way of life. You serve to show compassion and grace and love. You serve to show that there are second chances and to show that God does not give up on people. You don't serve for power, recognition, popularity, or applause. You give when it's not easy and sacrifice when it's hard. You have found joy when you put yourself second. You believe in a story bigger than yourself and a dream that only God can deliver on. What you do matters. It matters more than you often realize. Together we can do so much. Together we are used by God. And if you're not part of this story, we invite you in. And to all of our volunteers, we thank you. We honor you. We couldn't do church without you being the church. As we gather for a time of prayer, and we also want to acknowledge that the flowers given this morning in our sanctuary are given by Tony and Nancy Raskoff in loving memory of Tony's parents, Anthony and Viola, and that the flowers are also given by Marion Chase in loving memory of Bob Chase. And volunteers, of course, were responsible for bringing up the flowers and presenting them as we prepared for worship this morning. If you've come this morning with a prayer need, I want to assure you that one of our prayer partners would be honored to come alongside you immediately following the service to pray with you. All you need to do is remain where you are in your seat and a member of our prayer team will come and find you and join with you in prayer. May we open our hearts to God. Please pray with me. Faithful Lord, 
we have a tendency to settle for so little. Of course, we love to be entertained, but we also know that it has such a short lifespan. We think of the moment rather than the eternities. And we are often preoccupied with simply what matters to us rather than why we're here and the purpose we can serve. We know that we live our life together in need of a shepherd. We can be out of control, lose direction, feel lost, have no idea where to turn. Startle us, O Lord, with the knowledge that you are already looking for us. Help us to rest in the thought that you never rest until your love finds a home in our lives. Sometimes we yearn to lie down in those green pastures. Our life feels so complex, overwhelming, we yearn to be refreshed. Help us to ponder that you make us lie down in green pastures. Peace is not something you simply offer. Oh Lord, it's something you bestow. Resting in you is not something simply made available, but you persist until we are able to receive the green pastures which you provide. Remind us, Lord, that as your servants in this world, we're also called to shepherd one another. Give us wisdom to lead thoughtfully and sensitively, treating each person we meet with dignity and affirmation. Bless those whom this day are looking for a pathway through their personal wilderness. Be with those who are bewildered by mounting tensions and concerns. Give us a desire for world peace that is as real as our desire for inner peace. We pray for the freedom and courage and security to look beyond ourselves and our own needs and be agents of healing and support to the lives of others. You know our struggles, O oh God. Lift us with the burdens we carry. Be with those who know particular need this day. Bless those who seek a sense of order and balance in their lives. Encourage those who are weighed down by distress and ever-changing life situations. Be beside those who seek your comfort in the midst of illness and weariness. May they feel your healing and renewing care upon them. And as you enrich us, O Lord, so purify us that it might be apparent to others that we have been with you. For we ask it in the name of Christ Jesus, our loving Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And with great gratitude in our hearts, may we continue 
to worship by sharing in our tithes and offerings. Jesus, friend of sinners, we have strayed so far away. We cut down people in your name, but the soil was never ours to sway. Jesus, friend of sinners, the truth becomes so hard to see.
Now, would you stand and sing um, our final song, Sing to the King? In this season of Lent, in all of our lives, we are called to reflect upon our faith and all those things that can distract us. And God delights to be with us in that reflection, to bring us to be the people He's created and redeemed us to be. That is our hope, our encouragement. And now may the grace and mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, fill your lives now and forevermore. Through Jesus Christ, our living Lord. Amen. Jesus.